Well, hello everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I started when I first got on with Katie today to say that with this topic, I had enough that we could go once a week for the full year. So now I've nibbled away 15 minutes. Um, my scheme with this is um, largely to just rummage around in all of art and looking at um, using some of the traditional ways of, of looking at art objects as uh, things made by certain people at certain times with certain subjects with certain histories and going back and forth from one to the other. Um, just taking the theme of the gods. And we're going to start with Zeus, Jupiter, or to the Romans also known as Jove. Um, and I'm going to concentrate primarily on his loves, but I have a little more before his loves. Uh, <clears throat> we're just plunging right in with the, a statue of Zeus that no longer exists. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it was in this, as it's reconstructed, a temple of Zeus at Olympia in the Peloponnese, um, the site of the Olympic Games. And it's from the middle of the fifth century. It was a kind of a, the temple itself wasn't so great. It was an area where they didn't have marble. So they have, it's made of limestone and then they just put marble sort of paste over it to make it look like the columns are marble. But the interior, the whole thing disappeared in, um, was pillaged and then it was destroyed in floods. But there are ancient copies and ancient descriptions of it. And the main feature of this was the statue of Zeus inside. That's one of the seven wonders. It was over 40 feet high. And um, there was a second century, essentially, travel writer named Pausanias who gave a very good, thorough description of it. It rose to the height of the building. The building did not have a barrel vault like this. This is a later artist's reconstruction of it. But it was a chryselephant king st statue. So that's a, a term you can bandy about when you want to. It means that it's composed of, of gold and ivory. Now, of, of course, the main part of it is probably uh, essentially a wooden substructure. And then every area there is flesh is ivory plaques. And then where uh, there's clothing, footstool, throne, oak leaf helmet, scepter, those are all of gold leaf. This gold and the ivory had to be easily enough detached so that if this place were under attack by some hostile force, they could um, save the parts and put them back in place later on. Um, so it was enormously elaborated with uh, sculptures of all kinds and, and painted and, and uh, as well, with scenes of various mythologies having to do with Zeus, but it's to carry the idea of that, the grandeur and his power, he's ever victorious, that's a Nike or victory who's about to hand him the wreath. And on the top of his long scepter, there's the eagle, his symbol. So he presides over the heavens, he presides over human affairs, he doesn't always get his own way, but He's always up to something. So we have this description, and then there are a few coins. Uh, this is a coin for Alexander the Great, and he's taken the eagle, whoever the coin, numismatic uh, artist who did this, took the eagle off the top of the scepter and now puts it on Zeus's hand. But that's an example, so that would be around 300 BC. And then here's a coin from the Emperor Hadrian in Rome in the second century AD, a slightly more accurate representation. And since I'm talking about the images and their aftermaths, I think we ought to consider this one of the, of the, of the progeny from that statue. This Horatio Greeno's statue of George Washington. Oh yeah, you know him. Uh, I imagine some of you have seen this. It's um, in the Smithsonian Museum of uh, American Art. 
now. It was an early example of a statue placed in the Capitol causing controversy. Uh, it was made to celebrate the centennial of George Washington's birth. And it was installed around 1840. And a number of people were offended that rather than showing him um, in realistic garb or as a general, he's shown with a completely neoclassical body with the body of the Olympian Zeus. Uh, here, what he has in his hand, he's um, the outstretched hand has a sheathed sword, which he's handing to the American public as he's ceding the power. It's an indication that the presidency is going to pass on from one person to the other. So there's, there's a kind of a political declaration in that. Well, it got moved from the Capitol and then it was out on the lawn for a while and then it got moved to the museum. Here he is on the side. It's actually the Romans used to do that too. They'd take a, a body that signified something and then they'd put a head of a real person on it about whom they wanted to signify something. Now this is actually a, a, an authentic Greek bronze of Zeus with his uh, thunderbolt. And that's their, their force, thunderbolt, of course, lightning. But this sort of like a double-ended pointed object is the Greek way of um, representing it. And here, in his wrath, whatever he's, his wrath is, is directed at, we have no idea, but it shows him in action. So there you have his characteristic pose, you have his, his attributes. And then this is where we're going to go, which is one of his most characteristic activities was engendering more. Um, he had um, a wife, his sister Hera, who was always rightfully suspicious of him and his uh, amorous nature. And then he had um, adventure after adventure with mortal and immortal women um, producing further gods or semi-divine beings. Uh, this is a painting by um, Angre in the 19th century. And you can see he's here trying to give you that, that Olympian Zeus in all his brooding majesty. And with that, look at that eagle looking at him and that wonderfully boneless uh, young woman who's looking up at him, that's Thetis. Uh, we're not gonna talk about her much, but she's imploring this uh, God to be charitable toward her son who was Achilles. Hera is, and can you see her up here? Watching what's going on. There are allusions to um, Napoleon in this, and th this is a big painting, it's over eight feet high. There's one of Zeus's amorous escapades that artists found extremely difficult to show. And I'll just give you a couple of those. And then we'll, I have several that will concentrate on mainly to die. So the one that is, was hard to literally to picture was Zeus's affair with um, an ocean creature named Metis, M-E-T-I-S. Uh, she was um, sort of patroness of uh, wisdom, cleverness, craftiness, things that the Athenians especially were proud of in, in themselves. So Zeus had an affair with Metis, and only after he embarked on this affair did he receive an oracle that Metis would bear two children who would be greater than he was. Well, of course, that's not to be allowed. Uh, he, Zeus himself, had, had to slay his own father to rise to power. There's a lot of that in, in these myths. So to, what he did with Metis is that he transformed her into a fly and he swallowed her. But she was already pregnant. So uh, she's busy inside Zeus. She's 
busy making a lot of noise because she's crafting armor for her child who's going to be Athena. And all this racket was just making Zeus go as berserk as I am as hearing my cat yelling at me in the background right now. And uh, so Zeus implored Hephaestus, the blacksmith god whom you see over here, um, to just whack him in the forehead uh, to get rid of this terrible headache he had. And out popped Athena, fully armed, fully clothed, and fully adult. Now, how are you going to show that in art? Well, this is uh, on uh, the rim of a Greek drinking cup. And the, so it's just a pottery, and these would not be major artists. The Greeks, we know, um, valued painting, but painting is so fragile. It's only in rare instances there are some scraps um, of originals left, and it's largely we see what must have been the themes in paintings painted by potters in dilute clay, like this black on the orange, or with a little red and a little white added to it here. So that's one, that's from around 550 BC. And here's a slightly later, this is a narrow necked, you should be like the Greeks, like, like Greek archeologists, Greek specialists. Now you do not call these vases, you call these pots. So on this Greek pot, here sits Zeus with his thunderbolt. Now she's got quite a spring to her step as she's coming out. This is probably Hera. This would be the musician god, that's Apollo. This is uh, Mercury, the messenger god. And this is probably Ares, the warrior god over here, all dumbfounded at this strange event. And this is later, this is mm, in the 400s, mid 400s. Uh, and it does, these are way we know what was going on in painting when it sort of filters down to what just pot painters are doing. Um, and what we can see that there's been some advance in painting that this they're trying to do foreshortening instead of showing everything in profile. And this is done with, mm, let's say, only a moderate degree of success. Those t toes look properly foreshortened, but those knees are pretty weird. But these figures turn to either side. Out she comes again. And now you see here's Hephaestus. And I want to show you a detail. It has real dramatic possibility. Look at Hephaestus. He's looking up. So there must have been a well-developed narrative visual arts, three-dimensional scenes in space that are recorded as they can be on these Greek pots by the um, middle of the late, or late fifth century. Here it says Hephaestus, the name is written right there. Well, the most important of all the scenes of the birth of Athena is right here. Um, that's, this is the Parthenon. You might even guess that from the heads down here, swarming around. Um, built by Phidias, uh, who's the overseer, just as he'd made the, um, the Olympian Zeus. He probably oversaw the sculpture that was on it. And there was sculpture on the pediment up here. The pediment, uh, well, the whole reason the building even exists after Christianity supplanted the belief in the pagan gods, was that this was turned into a Christian church in the sixth century, and it was a church dedicated to the Virgin Mary, quite appropriate for a temple that was to the Virgin goddess, Athena, whose statue stood inside. And at the east end, um, facing the sun, the rise of everything new, up in the pediment, we know, was the story of the birth of Athena, the beginning of something new. But undoubtedly when this was turned into a church, this is the area where the apse, you know, the holiest part of the church is at the east end, and they would have knocked through this section. So that was destroyed probably very early. Most of the rest of the destruction in the temple came um, in the 
Well, let's see, 17th century, I think. Let me just check so I shouldn't be giving you this information. No. Yeah, 17th century. Uh, when uh, Greece was part of the Turkish Empire and the Turks had an arsenal stored adjacent to this building, the Venetians were attacking the Turks in, in Athens and they lobbed a shell that, that exploded the arsenal and that destroyed, knocked down most of the building. So that's when the sculpture that we see in the British Museum uh, it was after that it was then sent to London. But fortunately, be, just before that explosion that just brought everything to the ground, there was a Frenchman who had been uh, commissioned essentially to make drawings of the extant sculpture on the Parthenon. So this is one end. The birth would have been way off the edge over here. And then the word is being spread out to the gods who are from standing to reclining, neatly wedged into the space. And you see them when you go to London. Oh, they're gorgeous. And on the other end, see again, all this already gone. That's these. Now there's been an attempt in, the, in Greece to reimagine what the center looked like uh, and this is the, it's based on some paintings that survive. So they didn't try to, the, the sculptors didn't do anything that's as implausible in stone, which is, has a greater actuality than a painting does. It's, after all, it's palpable, three-dimensional, um, to show a little fully formed person, especially someone who is important as Athena, just popping out of the top of his head would be pretty ludicrous. So here you have, to fill the greater height at the center, you have Zeus on his throne. And then here's Athena walking away. She's about to be crowned with victory. And here's Hephaestus with his ax over here. So that's all I'm going to show you about the birth of Athena, because that's about the demise of, of attempts to even show that quite miraculous story. And then the scheme that I um, uh, would like to follow for probably the rest of this class, next class, and I don't know if it'll go into the one after that possibly, will all be on the loves of Zeus. And I'm going to start with four paintings made by one particular artist and use those um, to to review the stories and tell about their histories. And then they're going to come back and show all of the subsequent generations with the amazing works up through 20th century, Cy Twombly, Robert Rauschenberg, taking the same subjects. So the artist whose four paintings are going to concentrate on now has, um, I suppose, not a big name now. Uh, Antonio Correggio, C-O-R-R-E-G-G-I-O. Now I'm going to give, um, the, Katie's going to send you uh, an email with some of the names so that you don't have to either just forget about them or struggle to, to capture them for yourself. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, so this, so Correggio was an artist of the early 16th century from the area near Parma in Northern Italy. And he did um, ceiling paintings, uh, religious ones, very, very fine. He, he didn't have a lot of immediate impact on others, but he also did these um, quite marvelous mythological paintings. And he did four on the loves of Jupiter because now we're dealing with the Italian word and the world, and they're basing their knowledge largely on the writings of Ovid, the Roman writer from the time of Augustus, who in his book, The Metamorphoses, The Transformations, um, goes, uh, includes many of the myths of Jupiter and his transformations. 
um, to be able to sleep with these various women. Now this one is Leda and the Swan. I grew up calling it Leda. I see it's equally, you can say Leda, L-E-D-A. The story is that Jupiter was being chased by an eagle. And to escape the eagle, he plummeted to the ground and right into the willing embraces of this nymph, Leda. So uh, she is the daughter of a king in um, southern Greece. Um, she's also married to a king, King Tyndarius. Well, she sleeps with Zeus, and evidently that same night, supposedly, she sleeps with her husband, and she produces two eggs. Uh, um, there are different versions of the story of uh, other sources. From these eggs, we know what four children come, but which ones were paired together, we don't know. There were Castor and Pollux, the brothers, one of whom was immortal and one was mortal. Because since she slept with both men the same night, there's a mixing of the seed. Uh, so some of her children are immortal and some are mortal. Uh, <clears throat> so Castor and Pollux, one was immediately in the heavens and the other was immortal. Um, then Helen of Troy was one of her children and Clytemnestra. And so you see from her will come the whole story of the Trojan War. So this is a very, very fateful couple. But the reason it was so interesting to especially rulers in Europe who knew the Ovidian stories or ones like that, as they saw Jupiter as a prototype for their power. So there's a degree of flattery in having anything about Jupiter. Um, and actually, Correggio did this for a man, the Duke of Mantua. Now, Mantua's halfway between Milan and Venice. And it was a, it was a powerful um, little kingdom. But this Duke of Mantua, the Dukes of Mantua, supposedly traced their ancestry back to Jupiter. So they had an extra reason for liking him. So Correggio did four of the loves of Jupiter for the Duke of Mantua. And uh, the other three that we'll look at subsequent to this, there's going to be uh, Jupiter and Danae, Jupiter and Eo and Jupiter and Ganymede. But I want first to say a little more about this particular one. Not about the subject. I'll uh, hear two little cherubs. That's, and this is probably the god of love over here. These might be two other moments in the story here. She, this is not really clear whether she first spies a swan here. And this is afterwards, you see now the swan leaves. And this is the culminating moment here at the center. I'll give you a nicer one of the central sections so you can see the color. With these wonderful, misty, bluish, um, tree-filled, watery, uh, moist landscapes in the background. I don't know when you look at this. Oh, well, you look at this. This face. Now, I, having looked at this and read about this, know to look at this and say, yuck. It looks a little fatuous. Well, you need to know the history of this painting. So the Duke of Mantua had it. Evidently he died shortly after these paintings were done. He probably had the four made for a room in his summer palace called the Avid Room, and it was the room of his mistress. So it's appropriate to have these kind of erotic subjects there. But at his death, or maybe he gave them before he died, he gave them to the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, a lot of diplomacy was handled over art through gifts of art among the cognoscenti 
and diplomacy and the discussions uh, going on ostensibly about art, but then they could be around a lot more important um, topics. So they went to Spain. Then it went to Prague with the Holy Roman Emperor in Prague and Rudolf II. And then in warfare, the King of Sweden um, conquered Rudolf and he took these back to Sweden. Then King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden, his daughter Christina was extremely straight laced. She abdicated from the throne. She took her paintings and she went to Rome. She, I think she entered a Catholic order. Um, <clears throat> so she took them to Rome, a Roman cardinal bought them. And then they end up being bought by um, the regent of France in the 18th century. And his son found the portrayal of Leda. I'm getting back to her. So offensive. His son was, um, I guess from our point of view, you'd say he was a religious fanatic. He found it so offensive that he slashed the painting and destroyed the face. Well, then later on, someone was asked to fill in the missing uh, parts of the painting and another Frederick the Great will then buy it. And at one point, Napoleon confiscated this painting. And then finally in 1830, the head was repainted yet again. So this is a 19th century head on a painting that has traveled everywhere and had many travails going back to the 16th century. Uh, originally, instead of this rather, um, well, slightly cherubic looking face. Her head was back and it was much more a state of uh, physical ecstasy represented on her. Then, here's another one of those four. This is the Danae. Now, that's D-A-N-A-E with those double dots over the E, the umlaut, Danae. also then for the Duke of Mantua. So she was the daughter of a king of central southern Greece. And her father received a prophecy that she would have a son who would slay him. Well, can't have that. So the father, a uh, man named, well, Acrisius, had her, he built a great bronze tower and had her locked up in the tower so that no suitor could reach her to make sure that she never bore a child. The tower evidently was open at the top and Jupiter spied her and he visited her in the form of a shower of golden coins. So that's what's here, here she is. The bed sheet is pressed out and here Cupid, and here's the cloud from which the coins are going to rain down. Um, all of these figure types with a kind of a high waist and full breasts like that, that um, sometimes there might be based on some knowledge of the actual female body, but they're more derived from the Greek ideal females known in statues. But here, then there are two little cherubs. And what they're doing, they have arrows. And they're, one, um, they're testing these arrows. One is of lead and one is of gold. If it's gold, it brings real love. And if it brings lead, it brings torment. So that's a little episode of another story. You see how he indicates that it's this tower setting. This is a story since antiquity was um, given a special sort of moralizing meaning. Oh, well, I'll tell you the moralizing meaning then I have to go back and tell about it because of course she does bear a son. The moralizing meaning is that any woman can be bought for gold. It's the corrupting value of money. Now, her child is Perseus. He who 
slays the Gorgon and has the Medusa head. And if we have a chance, we'll get to that too. Not for today, not next week though. The third one, this is Jupiter and Ganymede, G-A-N-Y-M-E-D-E. -E. Now, Homer um, in the Iliad makes comments that suggest he knows the story. All of these stories predate anyone's writing them down. That's why there are so many different versions of them. But he knew this story. And back at the time of Homer, which would be the 8th century BC, it's supposed, um, the story wasn't seen so much as carrying um, homoerotic qualities as it does later on in Greek art and in Roman art and some late, later out we'll look at it that. But supposedly Zeus saw Ganymede, who was a Trojan shepherd, supposedly the most beautiful of all the boys in the world, of young men, out with his flocks. So Jupiter now, in the form of an eagle, comes down and seizes him and takes him up to join the gods because he has a beauty that belongs only with the immortals. And he serves as the cupbearer for the gods for Zeus and the other gods. But by the time already when Correggio is doing it, there is much more uh, an emphasis on the sexuality of the scene, not just on the God's love of, of beauty. So here's his frantic dog yapping down below as he's carried away another, over another gorgeous landscape and the talons of the eagle hold on as the boy is carried away, looking back down at us. Is it? tricky painting to pull off, how you show a, a flesh and blood living being up in the sky before they had a conception of flying, you know. And this is the one that gets more often in textbooks now. Um, this is Jupiter and Io. Um, Io was a priestess of Jupiter's wife, Hera. And she was beautiful and Jupiter lusted after her. She ran from him. She did not want to be captured. There's, that's also a very common theme of uh, in many religions of mortals trying to flee the embrace, the dangerous embrace of a divine. Uh, <clears throat> but, and she, her father was a river god. She tried to hide in the woods, but Zeus would of course have his way. Jupiter would have his way. So what he did was become a deep, dark cloud over the whole area. And he came down to her. Now Hera, on seeing this cloud, knew that Jupiter was up to something. So she came down, she saw Jupiter, and accused him of some kind of hanky-panky. Jupiter, upon seeing Hera arrive and knowing her, her um, the vengeance he would take on his inamorata, turned Io into a cow, a beautiful white heifer. And so the cloud grows back and Hera sees the heifer, no mortal. And Hera says, oh, that is a beautiful cow. Would you give it to me as a present? Well, she's got Jupiter there, right? I mean, how, how can he, he can't say, he can't say no, because he can't acknowledge that she's, she's a, um, a mortal, just transformed momentarily into a heifer. So there's um, more to this story, and we'll look at paintings that take this story to the end. If you want to know about Io, 
um, just in terms, she, at one point she, she, as a cow is tormented by flies and she travels all over to be chased away, chased around by these flies. The Ionian Sea takes its name from her. That's the Mediterranean sort of off Corfu over to Southern Italy. And the Bosporus, the water between Turkey and um, the Eastern and Western part of the, which means the ox crossing. Those are both taken from her name. But this is what a marvelous painting and what a bold painting it is. How do you, uh, Correggio is famous for his handling of really soft, melting flesh. But how do you show something even softer in paint? Clouds. Clouds that look as if they would be like a powder puff if you touch them, but they're nothing when you touch them. And you see the face just coming through there. That's a marvelously bold painting. And the face of the lady and the swan was probably like that. <laughs> so agitated that Louis Philippe's son. And now, we'll go back. So those are the four paintings by Correggio, this suite of four of those loves. And now I want to start the sort of the, those stories through time, starting with Leda. If you're really up on your Greek, you'll even see her name is written up here. That's kind of interesting habit on these pots. This is a big wine containing, um, almost the size of an urn. And it was found in Italy. Uh, <clears throat> it's from the fourth century, probably early fourth century. So <laughs> here you can see, it's looked like her passion is such great that she's almost s sweeping the swan off its feet there uh, as she's embracing it. There were undoubtedly plays on these as well as poetry. And this is a so-so mm, painting in a pot. And this is, to my mind, just the most awful looking statue. Uh, <clears throat> but imagine even doing this as a statue. It's a Roman copy of, um, we think of, uh, uh, well, it's a Roman copy of a Greek statue. We think by a man named Timotheus. And this must, the original must have been powerfully popular because there are over a dozen copies that still survive. Um, when you look at Roman copies of Greek sculptures, right away you have to just forget about, look at that jawline and that, is that a, I don't know, too smooth, too, too sudden a break right there, too exaggerated a line for the curve. It's just like, yeah, who would look at this a second time? Look at that meaty hand on there. That's because, um, there was a process by which Romans copied statues, a kind of a mechanical process. They could exactly copy the proportions and the pose. And they, had, they set up this kind of wooden scaffolding and they, they could work out the coordinates for all parts of it. And then they could set those around a block of marble and then work in on the block of marble till it matched what it should have been. And then just, you know, just journeyman marble carvers would come in and do all the surface details. So that's why when you look at the Roman works, you're just getting a dim sense of what the original was like. Here's one that's in the Getty. You see, this one even has a slightly different head. I about passed this by when I first saw this one on Google. It's, it's a fresco. I think you can see the wall back here. So this is painted plaster and it's on a villa near one of the main streets in Pompeii. It was not, discovered fairly recently when they were doing some sort of like shoring up areas that looked in danger of falling down there. Uh, so he, Here's, here's our swan, whose neck is accommodatingly accordioned 
into this space. When you look at the detail of it, when it was, you see here, it's just being emerged, scraping away that accretions on it to, to see it. She's looking out at you, and then it has a little more life to it as, as the swan is also looking at her. So this is just a decoration in the house. Maybe it's in the bedroom, mm, not necessarily in the bedroom. Uh, and it just shows you how common these stories were. It's quite possible that this is a copy of some well-known painting that's now lost. Certainly the copyist is no great shakes. If this is a leg here, you take that in. Okay, where does that attach to her? Would it be up here somewhere? <laughs> so this is someone who's just sort of mindlessly copying. Or this is maybe as late as the fourth century AD. And this is a mosaic that was found in the, it was like a, they're called emblems. They're a square in the middle of a mosaic floor, probably in a fairly well-to-do villa in Cyprus. Um, the Romans did value rear entry sex, so it's not too unusual to see her in this position. And uh, here the swan turns around. So that's household, and this is also household. This is a lamp. You're just looking down from the top. They used olive oil lamps, um, told by someone who specialized in, in, in this, that um, burning their quality of olive oil had no odor to it at all. And so there would be a, a wick of some sort put in here. And then, so you're looking at it from the top. They're sort of like shallow cups. And it was set up on a stand. So here you have the same story. So they're just part of ordinary life. Or something really awful. <laughs> Wonderfully awful. This is a bronze from about the fourth century. It's a, essentially, if I give it in the most inglorious language, it's a big safety pin. It would have been used to fasten a cloak, some man's cloak, probably, of Leda and the Swan. Well, we go from there to Leonardo. And if it's all right with you, I'm going to take those extra 15 minutes of, of com computer glitch. Um, this is an original drawing. Uh, Leonardo did two versions of this in the first decade of the 16th century. So we have this drawing of one with the eggs down here and the children emerging. Uh, she's really um, a lot of torsion in her body and this too. And look how there's that Leonardo love, these curling lines, like he loves the swirling lines of water, the lines in the trees or in the bushes that, that just seems to come with a flick of his wrist. So we have that and this really grotesque copy someone made of a, by a follower of him. I think you could, you'd know this is not Leonardo, but that's like a Leonardo head and this kind of misty rocky landscapes like the Mona Lisa. These little kids look more like Raphael's. So this is a person putting together all sorts of stuff. But this probably is a good record of what Leonardo was painting. The general presentation was that painting uh, was taken to France and was destroyed sometime probably in the late 16th century. Again, probably the destructions in these has to do with religious fervor, that these are just considered inappropriate. And he did this second version with later standing. Uh, so this is, again, a copy by another artist. Even Raphael made a drawing based on that. And there are other Leonardo drawings from the, that survived to give us an idea of the original as this head. 
that's in the Windsor Castle collection. So that's that kind of ethereal beauty. You have to think back into this. Now, here's a very different kind of leader in this one. This is actually by Rubens at the very beginning of the 17th century. Um, when he just, he went to Rome for about 10 years, well, to Italy for 10 years to look at the works of the great masters and made, he made copies, he actually made two copies of it for his files so that he would have that as an inspiration for later on. This, uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, Michelangelo's work and have been to Florence might have a sense like, mm, this looks like something you've seen, and you're going to see it in a moment again. But you see, this is a far more muscular, completely different, totally Michelangelo body type. Uh, as she flings her leg over the swan, so you see the willing embrace. And this is by another anonymous artist. When you have two where the figure is identical like that, near, as near identical as you can get, what you know you have are paintings um, based on one original, and sometimes it might even be based on the drawings from which the original painting was made. And they could come in any size because you can do what's called square up a painting. You can make it like a grid. You know how much of what goes into what grid. You can make it bigger, you can make it smaller, but you can preserve the composition and the proportions. So what's that like? We know that Michelangelo did a tempera painting, which also was taken to France and was destroyed in France. But it's like the figures in the Medici chapel tombs. It's like the figure of night. That extreme torsion and that extraordinary long body. Moreover, there was a sculptor shortly after Michelangelo. Now you have to follow this. Not copying Michelangelo's sculpture, but turning into sculpture Michelangelo's painting of the later. And as late as the 18th century, this is a little terracotta based on it, made far more erotic beguiling, small, and sweet. I'll go right beyond that. I would like to get through later before you go, before I go. This is by Boucher in the 18th century. He became, after this painting, the painter to the King of France, but he's known for his lovely, luscious, erotic paintings, deft paintings, soft colors, Dimpled nudes, always young, always carefree, as in this lady in the swan from 1732, where Boucher, since he's so known for these ladies, has even introduced an extra one. She has, she has no role in the story at all, but lets him show a figure from the front and show a figure from the back. Uh, Moreau, I'm going to have to go beyond that. That's a bad one for me. Cezanne did it. Early in his career, he, was, he did a few based on classical myths. Salvador Dali did it. This is just called Leda Atomica, where he uses a portrait of his wife. And it's, and it's the setting, this evidently you can recognize this these rocks, it's a silhouette of a certain area on the Costa Brava. But the extraordinary thing here, this is from 1942. Look at this, everything floats. Even the water 
doesn't touch the shore. Dali, this is after the explosion of the atomic bomb, after the knowledge that atoms, that the physical world on the atomic level, items don't touch one another. Everything comes near but never touches. And he said, in your paintings, you have to show the science that you know is true. So nothing in here touches. Look, there's a terrible reproduction, but just how easy it is to be misled to think that she's holding the swan's head, but she isn't. Her hand's out in front. It could also be sort of um, analogized as being like the Virgin Mary, who was sometimes thought that the Holy Spirit came to her in the form of a dove and came in through her ear. So there's a kind of a quasi religious reading of this possible. And this is the last one I'll show you for today. This is Cy Twombly. This is 1950, let me just no, 62. It's six foot three by six foot six. Cy Twombly is sort of a, mm, slightly later than some of the abstract expressionists, but working this really a very correct characteristic, easily identifiable style. He, they're just like um, scribbles. It's like, it's like uh, just taking your pen and going back and forth. And this is definitely Leda and the Swan. I'll show you the whole painting, but this is to give you this idea of the size. He has written Swan down here. This is a much better color. Twombly painted this while he was living in Rome. And this kind of crusty, almost peeling parts of this, this blotchy section, is like the damage on old frescoed walls. And then, this is in the Museum of Modern Art. Um, there are some features here, it's probably, Correct to read these, so these would be like hearts for love. Here the lines are more jagged and these become hearts. And this is rather like a great big phallus right here in the middle. And this would all be like the rushing beating wings. So we'll save Dan and I till next time. Um, I think I will again, oh dear, no, no, I don't want to do that. In this new scheme where Katie is also helping me out, um, if you have my email, if you have questions, because I think some of these like, what's that? What were you saying? What's that? Um, uh, either ask, Katie to forward them to me, or if you have my email, ask me, and then I will get some document to you. And well, here we have Dan I on a Greek pot, and here come the gold coins down to her. But I will now leave. I hope you have a nice week. I, I hope to see you next week. Thank you, Maggie. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good week. So, so everybody muted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maggie. Well, I can answer a question now if you have any. Uh, yeah, can we see the the um, Cezanne again? Is that possible? Well, I could try. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I think he did this uh, early on, about the same time he did a, a little one called an Olympia with a, a suitor in a black suit and a bouquet of flowers, looking at Olympia, Olympia sprawling on a bed. It's when he was young and ardent himself that he did this. Thank you. Yeah. This is marvelous, Maggie. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.
Thank you. I love the questions. I love even more. So if you have questions, please, next time, let me know. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye now. Take care. Maggie, when you said one of the coins was, oh, she's gone. No, I'm here. Oh, when you said one of the coins was more authentic, more something than the other, what did you mean by that? Well, the second century writer described the, the I think those, those are legitimate coins. I mean, there's fakery in the coins everywhere. But um, the, the, the verbal description says that uh, Zeus in his right hand is holding up a figure of Nike and that the eagle is on the top of his scepter. So that coin just put the eagle down in his hand instead of up on the scepter. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Why you. is one going way back? Oh, I wish I knew. Thank you. Goodbye.